So as people are filing in, welcome. Welcome to the first installment of the I Can't Believe It's Not Better seminar series. Um, I'll say a couple words about the seminar series. So it's it's going to, if we're successful, it's going to be a little bit different than the usual research seminar series that is focused around a scientific discipline or a, or a technical topic. Um, in this case, the seminar series is organized around an experience or a feeling that I think many people in machine learning and statistics share. And the feeling is this, we, we build models and methods and we do so, uh, and when we do so, we're guided by some hodgepodge of theory and intuition and tricks of the trade, rules of thumb. And we build these models and methods that we think are gonna work and then we implement them and we try them on data and then they don't. Um, and we get stuck because we feel like that hodgepodge of theory and intuition has led us astray. And we, and we really like this model of method that we designed. We designed it to be appealing and, um, and we find it very beautiful and we wanna tell our colleagues about it and write about it, but we can't because it doesn't work. So um, this seminar series is gonna sort of explore that experience from multiple angles. Some speakers are gonna tell us about a project that they're currently stuck on, that they're getting unexpected results that prompt some new investigation into um, prevailing wisdom. Some speakers are gonna tell us about a project that currently works, but they're gonna unroll it and they're gonna give us a, a retrospective on how they got it to work. And some speakers are going to provide us with some new theory or some new tool that, um, that helps patch some existing gap between theory and practice that a lot of researchers are getting stuck on. And I think that the best talks um, are gonna do some combination of all three. And today I think we're gonna have one of those talks. So we're very happy to uh, introduce Tamara Broderick. Uh, Tamara is an associate professor at MIT in electrical engineering and computer science. She's a leading expert in many areas of machine learning and statistics. Uh, she's received many awards. Her dissertation work at UC Berkeley with Mike Jordan received the Savage Award. Um, she's received many grants and fellowships from Sloan and ONR and several others. And she was recently selected as one of nine people to form the COPS Leadership Academy. So we're very lucky to have Tamara. Um, I know her best as a Bayesian non-parametrician, but she's here today to tell us about her work, recent work in econometrics, which is not a traditional bastion of Bayesianism. Um, I will, uh, before handing it off, I, uh, so if you have questions, uh, just type them in the chat. We, uh, Tamara is actually gonna be looking at the chat as well, and maybe we'll answer some questions. We also have some organizers that might um, let her know about uh, some questions. Uh, and um, and oh, also I'll tease, we're gonna be holding this uh, seminar monthly and um, in the next couple months we're going to have um we're going to have uh tom diedrich and cynthia rudin and many other many other exciting speakers so um check us out on our website and 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 stay tuned uh with that tamra thank you for being here and um welcome great thanks so much wow what an awesome lineup that sounds like uh, is already together i'm so honored to 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 be here and um and be a part of this great so okay today i'm going to try to hit the major themes, at least uh, many of the major themes of I can't believe it's not better. I'm going to start with a talk that's really about this idea of backing up to see what can be going wrong with our existing standard data analysis methods. Um, I think we're going to see the importance of something that's on the I can't believe it's not better website, the, the importance of stepping away from leaderboardism um, when we're really trying to, to make an impact and do useful data analyses. Um, and then I'll finish up with a, a bit about the nonlinearity of our particular research process uh, for this work, um, as well as a, a related open problem that we are truly stuck on. And I, but I like genuinely think that somebody else can solve. So hopefully one of, one of you will be that somebody else. Okay, so let me go ahead and, and start with this, this first part of the talk where I'll be talking about sort of, hey, you know, I have this data analysis, I want it to change people's lives, what could go wrong, and can we have a check to help us with that? Um, before I go on, I just want to emphasize uh, my, my two uh, amazing collaborators on this work. Um, so first, there's my postdoc, Ryan Giordano, he's on the academic job market right now, and I think whoever gets him is going to be super lucky to have him and uh, our amazing economics expert collaborator, Rachel Meeker, who's a professor at the London School of Economics, and we're so lucky to work with her. Okay. So in some sense, uh, at the very high level today, we're thinking about, you know, when can I trust my data analysis for making big decisions? Um, on the plus side, I think the story of the past few decades is that as we get access to more data and better computation, data analyses increasingly have the ability to drive life-changing decisions. Um, when we think about life-changing decisions, these could be in the medical sciences. They could be medical advances, they could be individual medical care. 
they could be cybersecurity, they could be personal finance, they could be financial policy writ large. But I think that in all of these cases and many more, we have sort of a, a like motif that we see in data analysis, a typical setup that inherently we're trying to generalize from one data set to a uh, future data. Um, we typically run a data analysis on some available data that we have to reach some decision. You know, maybe that decision is, hey, we ran a data analysis on microcredit, the efficacy of microcredit. So these are these small loans to individuals who are impoverished and the hope is that we will help bring them out of poverty. And so maybe we read an, ran an analysis on people in Mexico. Um, and now the idea is that from that analysis, we're not just going to conclude, hey, did those very particular people in Mexico benefit from microcredit in some sense? But we wanna say, hey, does microcredit work? Can I now apply microcredit as part of a policy decision, maybe in my government and help people out in a new time or a new place? And so we're applying that decision to new data. We see this in medical advances, again, in all of these cases that we just talked about. Now, a big concern that we're gonna have here though is, okay, yes, I ran this original data analysis. Does that mean I can safely generalize to the new data analysis? That, that if microcredit was good in the original data analysis, does that mean it's gonna be good in the new data when I actually apply it? You know, it's not even sort of data that I'm necessarily collecting, it's, it's me applying it in the real world. Okay, and the observation that we wanna to make today is that one case we might worry about generalization quality is if I had, an extremely small subset of my data that was instrumental to the original analysis. In some sense, we're asking here, you know, how could I detect that there might be a problem with generalization in the future? Um, and so here's a, a proposal. You know, if my analysis hinges on this very small subset of data, then I might worry. And so here, here's a real example that we're going to explore later on. We're going to see actually quite a few real data examples. Um, but one is a very real study of microcredit that somebody ran um, with 16,500 data points. That's pretty huge by the standards of, of social science, and I think even bigger by the standards of many other areas. Um, and we find that one data point drives the sign of the effect. We're going to see this later on, that if we remove one data point, that's the difference between microcredit helping people and microcredit hurting people. And so I, I, I think your intuition tells you that, yeah, that, that seems like a case where we should really understand What's happening with that one data point? You know, maybe maybe we're a little bit worried about this analysis once we hear that. Now, a few things you, you know that you you might think at this point is maybe you're thinking to yourself, um, you know, oh, I expect that you know when when I drop a tiny data and that a tiny bit of data and that changes my analysis, that's because I had so few data points to begin with. And here I would argue we we have a ton of data points, so it's not an issue of sort of you know very very small data. You might think, be thinking the problem is our ultra modern complex machine learning methods that we don't fully understand. And I'll tell you in advance that the analysis here uses a simple linear model. It could not be more understandable. So that's that's not the issue. Um, you might be thinking, ah, the problem is our, our crappy observational data that we have. We, we need you know, this really good um, you know, experimental data. This is a gold standard randomized controlled trial. So that's that's not the issue either. Um, and so we're gonna we're gonna dig into this uh, in the course of this talk and, and think about this more. Um, but why do we need to do sort of anything new here? Like why did we have to do some research? Um, well, the problem is that it's too computationally costly to check every data subset. We're gonna see that it would just be astronomically expensive. Even if your economist on the street had all the computing power of Google, it wouldn't save them. Um, and you just can't see what would happen by dropping every data subset. And so instead, we're going to provide a super fast and automated approximation. And it's one that you can just check at minimal cost after the fact. So we have some nice theory to support it. Um, but as I think is, is true in the spirit of this, uh, this, this monthly meeting, um, you might not always trust your theory. There might be some uh, assumptions that maybe aren't quite right in your case. And so here, you don't have to. You can, you can check it after the fact. OK. So that's, that's the idea, that's the, the, the main idea. So let's dig into all of these uh, points a little bit more. So in particular, um, in the rest of this part of the talk, we're gonna start by asking in a little bit more detail, why do we care about this idea of dropping data subsets? And by the way, just, just a priori, let me say, you don't always care about dropping a small subset of, of data points. And so I'll talk about some examples where you do care and some examples where you don't care, but I think it will be pretty general purpose, we'll see. Then we'll talk about how we'd like to drop data subsets to again check you know is our analysis really sensitive to is it really hinging on this very tiny part of our data then we'll talk about 
why is it so computationally expensive? You know, why isn't this something, I mean, it's very, it's very conceptually straightforward. Let's just drop a super tiny fraction of our data, um, but we'll see that it's very computationally expensive. So we'll have to deal with that. And so in particular, that's where we'll, we'll come in with our fast and automatic approximation. At that point, we'll see uh, that many analyses are robust and some are not. We'll look at a bunch of real data economics analyses, thanks to our collaborator in economics. Um, and, and for those of you who work in some area of machine learning, you might be thinking of like, I've heard of robustness before. Um, and the issue there is outliers or heavy tails or something like that. And I wanna just say upfront, that's a different type of robustness than what we'll be talking about today. We'll be talking about a very different type of robustness. We'll see that this type of robustness is not just a product of gross outliers. It's not just an issue that arises with large P values. It's not just heavy tails. You can't just get it for free from these other things that you might be used to um, looking at. And in fact, we're, we're gonna see some, some, um, some digging into the idea that it's actually really a product of signal to noise in the data. Um, so signal being sort of the information that we really care about, noise that's making it hard to access to that information. Okay, so let's start by talking about when do we care about dropping data subsets. Okay, well, first of all, let's just, let's just make the observation here um, that unfortunately, we often talk about sensitivity or robustness as though they're monolith. Um, and, and that's not true. The reality is that it's always shorthand. When we say sensitivity, we really mean sensitivity to some change. Every data analysis has to be sensitive to some change in the data. We really wanna ask what sort of the type of change that we would be concerned about, what types of sensitivity are really concerning to us. And that's gonna vary by problem. And so what I really wanna do now is just suggest to you that this type of sensitivity is a meaningful type of sensitivity that we should care about in many problems. It's never gonna be the case that you care about the same type of sensitivity in all problems, but in many problems, we care about dropping data. Okay, let's look at some concrete examples from economics. Why economics? Well, one, uh, it's super influential and it drives major policy decisions that affect all of our lives. Um, it's a uh, two fantastic, fantastically reproducible field. Man, as somebody who works in a, a bunch of different fields and we collaborate, my group collaborates with a lot of different um, areas, economics is doing really well. And I think there is so much that we could learn from them on this front. Um, and I'll come back to this later. Um, and then sort of more prosaically, we were just super lucky to collaborate with a wonderful economics expert in Rachel Meager. And so another reason to look at economics. Okay, so why do we care about dropping data? Well, let's talk about some things that, that come up in, in real data analyses um, that maybe we sort of tend to push under the rug, but are real concerns. Okay, the first is that we report a convenient proxy. So say, you know, again, that we're interested in the effect of microcredit. So we run this giant randomized controlled trial across villages, um, and we want to, typically what's gonna happen, I mean, this is exactly the analysis that people do when they're looking at microcredit, is they're gonna measure the business mean business profit of people who received microcredit and the mean business profit of people who did not receive microcredit. Okay, so now let's just imagine um, that as part of this analysis, uh, it just so happens that in one of the villages that received microcredit, Jeff Bezos walked into the village. I think we've lost Tamara. All right, let, let's give her uh, a few minutes to reconnect. Tabra, we me? lost you. We're back. You're oh, back. No. oh, no, I, you're back. No idea what happened there. Um, yeah, we don't see your slides. Okay, uh, yeah, I'll just share those. Yeah. Okay. Okay, great. <laughs> well, hopefully this is a, this is a one-time thing. Um, okay, great. So, um, so, so we're looking at an example from economics. Why do we care about uh, dropping, dropping data subsets? Um, and so in particular, uh, let's again imagine that we're looking at microcredit. And so like, again, the way that these, uh, these trials are actually run is that they look at basically the mean business profit of people who received microcredit and the mean business profit of people who did not receive microcredit. And so let's just imagine 
that of the people who received microcredit, um, Jeff Bezos walks into the village that receives microcredit. And so now the mean business profit of people who receive microcredit is absolutely through the roof. Um, and the mean business profit of people who did not receive microcredit is just naturally not going to be as high. Um, and so as it's not quite what we wanted to measure, right? It just happened that this one person completely threw off our notion of whether microcredit was working. Um, and so wouldn't it be nice if we had some method to just remove Jeff Bezos from our data set uh, and then we could say, okay, well, you know, is microcredit really helping a lot of people? And the issue here in some sense is that what we really wanted to measure was, you know, was microcredit helping a lot of people? But what in fact we measured because it's convenient and, you know, the usual way that people deal with these things is a mean rather than this notion of what we wanted to care about. Okay, so um, a similar issue can arise in a lot of other ways. So it could be, for instance, that in fact microcredit helps a very small proportion of rich people get much richer. Um, just a priori, this could be a possible thing. And poor people get poorer. And again, the average in general is going to be higher. And so now you're going to have this issue of, okay, well, that's not what we wanted to measure. We just happened to measure a mean because it was the convenient thing to do. If you're using a linear model as economists often do. That's just what you're, you're measuring. Um, I see that there's a question in the chat. I'm just going to go through these examples of why we care about this, and then I'll, then I'll hit that at the end. Okay. So another reason that we care about something like dropping data is that as we talked about in the beginning that what we really care about at the end of the day, typically in science or social science or engineering is learning some general truth and then applying it in a new domain. And so again, you know, we run our, our microcredit, you know, randomized controlled trial in some village in Mexico, but where we want to apply the ideas that we learn from that is in the future in another village. Maybe it's not even in Mexico. Or maybe it's the exact same village in Mexico, but it's some years later. And so naturally the people will not be exactly the same. And so we would worry if all of our analysis really, really hinged on an extremely small subset of people, that it was, it was that that was determinative rather than you know, really kind of learning some general thing that's going on in the population. Um, also, something that we definitely see in the social sciences is small fractions of data missing not at random. We're going to see an example later where, um, and as is often the case, uh, people were called on the phone to get their information. And so, you know, maybe some people do not have phones, maybe some people are not responding. And so we just often see fractions of the data missing. And, and you know, we have this notion of missing at randomness, but really our data is typically missing not at random. Um, and something that is just definitely true in the social sciences is that models are misspecified. So there are so many complex, fascinating things that are going on uh, in the world, and there's no way that our simple models are, are capturing all of that. Um, and so what do we do when those models are misspecified? Well, we would especially worry if they really depended on a super small subset of our data. Okay, so I'd argue that in all of these cases, we'd be concerned if dropping a very small fraction of data changed our conclusions. And something that I want to be super clear about here is that these concerns are not specific to economics. Um, definitely, if you are using a standard statistical or machine learning method, you are almost surely reporting a convenient proxy, whatever that method happens to return, not the thing that you ultimately super care about. This is, this is a representation in mathematics of some complex, difficult concept that you care about. It's one that's convenient, um, and we should recognize that. Uh, we are typically in science or social sciences trying to learn about some, you know, underlying phenomenon in the world, uh, and we are trying to apply it then in new cases. I mean, this is this is what sort of science and social science are about, and so we expect that like generalization is a concern for us. Our models are definitely misspecified, uh, unless you're in like certain areas of physics. For sure, your models are misspecified, and that's so going to be a real concern there. Okay. And I want to say that even if it, there are going to be cases, and I'll just mention a couple of now, where it does not bother you that a very small fraction of your data is driving your conclusions, uh, but I, I want to argue you should be upfront about it. So here's a couple of examples. Um, so one is uh, you are just keeping a historical record of whether microcredit helped this village. You are not trying to generalize. In that case, it doesn't matter, you know, if a small fraction of data is driving your conclusions, you're, you're just saying, hey, what happened here? It's just historical, you're not trying to make these generalizations. Another case is you're studying some rare event. Suppose you're you know, studying a, a town that has 10,000 people in it, 
And there are six car thieves in the control group. You have maybe a control and a, a treatment group, and there are three car thieves in the, in the treatment group. So it's around 0.1% or less of the town's population. You feel good that like in this town, there aren't too many people who are stealing cars. Um, but your audience should be clear that if you're trying to make some, some comparison between this control and treatment group, that your comparison is meaningfully based on six data points versus three data points. It's not based on 10,000 data points. Um, and so there are plenty of these rare case events where you know, we really do think a small fraction of our data is driving our conclusions. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be sensical to get rid of that small fraction of data. Um, but we do care about this. Okay, how would you account for robustness and economics data used in ML models given the wide disparity in measurement levels and reliability? I would say that that's sort of a, a um, an orthogonal concern to what we're talking about here. So maybe if uh, due to your measurement levels and reliability, uh, a super tiny sub fraction of your data is, is driving your analysis, maybe that's the concern you'll have. In some sense here, we're not saying what is the reason that a small fraction of data is driving your analysis. We're just here to flag if a small fraction of data is driving your analysis. And now what we recommend that you do is that you check out those data points. Maybe in the case of the car thieves, then you check them out and you're like, oh, the small fraction of data that is driving our conclusions is the set of car thieves. And so we're not too concerned because you know we know that that's the small fraction of data that should be driving our conclusions. Whereas if you were you know, the ec economist uh, studying microcredit, you see, oh, the small fraction of data that's driving our conclusions is in fact uh, hugely, has a huge amount of measurement error. We're really concerned that we were even measuring this correctly. Then you might say, ah, this is actually a real problem. We need to go back to the drawing board and make sure that our, our measurement error is, is sufficiently reliable that we can actually believe these concerns. Um, and we're actually gonna see how, how this could relate to this notion of signal to noise later. And so I think that um, when we look at our simulated data and these, these issues of signal to noise, there might be some more uh, insight into this exact question. Um, so hopefully hopefully when we, when we get to that, that'll be interesting. Okay, so hopefully at this point, everybody feels that we care about this notion of uh, dropping data and so now let's think about how would we actually do it. Okay, so first of all, let's talk about what, how we would like to remove data if we possibly could. So we might worry if removing a very small fraction of our data, as we just said, drives our analysis. So let's, let's start to add a little notation to this. Um, so one aspect of this is going to be just um, saying, okay, what is this small fraction of data? So let's go ahead and call alpha our small fraction of data. So it's a fraction of data. So we're going to, um, first of all, just uh, assume it's between zero and one for that reason. Um, and then in general, as we said, we're, we're really concerned when it's a small fraction of data. So let's go ahead and say that, you know, in general, we're only concerned when alpha is extremely small. Okay. So what does it mean to be concerned about our decision? Well, well let's think about what is driving our decision. So a typical set of things that we might care about are driving our decision. So one is maybe the sign of some effect. So maybe we have an effect that represents um, is microcredit, uh, uh, you know, helping or hurting, or how much is microcredit um, increasing business profit? And so we would, you know, feel that it is helping if that sign is positive. We'll feel it's hurting if that sign is negative. And so in that case, our decision is based on the sign of the effect. Another thing that we might really care about is the statistical significance of an effect. Um, so we might say something like, oh, well, you know, if it's statistically significant um, that, you know, microcredit is helping, then maybe we make our decision based on that. And so really typically we might look at something like statistical significance and sign of effect. Um, you know, so is the sign of the effect positive? Is microcredit helping? And do we feel that's a statistically significant result? And so we would be really concerned if we could drop an extremely small fraction of data and change to a statistically significant result of the opposite sign. That would be, that would be a big issue. Okay, so to that end, because we care about these things, let's go ahead and define um, one, what we're gonna call a maximum influence perturbation. This will be the largest possible change that we can get in some quantity of interest by dropping at most 100 alpha percent of our data. Um, so remember, we're dropping this alpha fraction of our data. We imagine it's very small. And so we're going to ask something like, what's the biggest change in, say, effect size we can get by dropping this very small fraction of data? And so if we can change it so much that we change, say, the sign of the effect, and that's what our decision is based on, then we would be concerned. 
Okay, now typically, as we just said, if we care about changing our decision by dropping the small fraction of data, we probably care like what were those data points that we dropped to change that decision. Um, and so we're gonna call that the most influential set. These are the data points that we actually dropped to achieve this maximum influence perturbation. What were the problematic data points? This is like the, you know, we pick up the Jeff Bezos in the data set. Okay, another way to look at this, another, another sort of uh, perspective on this is to talk about the perturbation inducing proportion. What is the minimum data proportion that we need to drop to achieve a certain change? So if we're interested again in say the sign of the effect, that's how we're making our decision. Then we wanna ask, what is the smallest amount of data we can drop to change that decision, to change that decision based on the sign? And so if we can drop a super, super tiny fraction of our data, then we'd be concerned if in fact, in order to change the sign, we have to drop a huge amount of data or there's no fraction of our data we could drop. You know, eventually, you know, if you have to drop something like 4% of your data or 10% of your data, yeah, I mean, everything's gonna change eventually. And so in this case, then you might not be so concerned. Okay, so how could I actually find these things? I mean, this is essentially what we're, what we're saying is let's, let's do an analysis where we find what's the small fraction that we can drop. Um, and so, the most straightforward way, conceptually straightforward way to do this is to rerun our data analysis with every appropriate subset of data drop. And so let's think about what would be required to do that. First, let's look at a very small data set. Suppose we only had 400 data points and the fraction that we're gonna drop is just 1%. Okay, so in that case, we want to drop every 400 choose four, four is 1% 1 of our data, data points. In fact, we also want to drop every 400 choose three and 400 choose two, et cetera. But let's just look at 400 choose four for the moment. That means we have to run our analysis over a billion times. And if our original data analysis takes one second, which I think if you run any data analyses, you know that this is uh, optimistic. If our original data analysis takes only one second, then this check would take over 31 years to run. And it gets worse. Let's look at 16,000 data points. So 16,000 data points is actually less than the microcredit study that we said that we were looking at. Let's like make it an easier problem. Let's only look at 0.1% of our data. So we're gonna look at 16,000 to 16 reruns of our data analysis. That's gonna be over 10 to the 53 reruns of our data analysis that we need to run. If every analysis takes one second, this check takes over 10 to the 46 years. Um, and so that's something where, you know, a lot of times we talk in, in machine learning about taking advantage of distributed computing and things like that. Distributed computing is not going to save you. Either. It's just not going to, to solve this. You're really going to need something fundamentally different. This is just truly impossible to run on any computing system that you could possibly have access to. Okay, so this is why we need an approximation. Okay, before I talk about what exactly is our approximation. Let's talk about actually running. So let's look at, in fact, this Angelucci et al. 2015 study. This is ex exactly the 16,561 households data set. It's a randomized controlled trial examining the effect of microcredit. It's one of seven very famous such trials. And in fact, it's the largest of them. Um, I cannot emphasize enough the fantastic reproducibility and data sharing. Uh, that's that's going on here. I mean, this is really, really wonderful. We were able to reproduce everything that um, this and other papers that we looked at were doing down to multiple decimal places. Okay, so here we have a super, super straightforward original model, which is great. So we can have a lot of intuition about it. Just a simple linear model. So here, the single covariate is a microcredit indicator. So for the nth data point, for the nth individual, this just says, did they get microcredit or not? In the randomized controlled trial, we know whether they were assigned microcredit, in which case this is one or zero, if they did not receive microcredit. Okay, YN is the business profit of this nth business. And here we're interested in these parameters, theta not and theta one, theta not is like the business profit if microcredit did not exist, the average business profit, and theta one is like the average effect of microcredit. How much is microcredit adding to business profit? And of course it could be negative. Okay, now there's actually a lot more that could go into this equation. It turns out there are tons more covariates that sometimes economists look at. And my understanding from talking to the economists is that it actually doesn't make a big difference and that we can really just look at this simple model um, and get about the same results. 
OK, so the result that we find, which is exactly what the original paper found, is theta 1 hat is negative 4.55 US dollars purchasing power parity every two weeks with a standard error of 5.88. OK, so it's negative, but it's not statistically significant. OK, so we can go ahead and do our check with our approximation. It takes two seconds to run, not 10 to the 46 years, as we said. So that's a big change. It's something we can actually run. And we can remove a single household and change the sign of the effect from negative to positive. Now, I think very reasonably you're thinking at this point, yeah, but it wasn't statistically significant. So like, do I really care? Would this change my, my results? Would it change my decisions? And I think perhaps you know, much more um, problematically, we can remove just 15 data points. That's less than 0.1% of the whole data set and get a statistically significant result of the opposite sign. So that would definitely be a different decision, a totally different decision, um, and one that results in a different level of investment in microcredit. Now, a couple of points. So I said that we have this theory that supports this approximation, that says it's a good approximation, that's nice, but the absolute key thing is that you can rerun the regression to check directly yourself. So in particular, you can actually remove these 15 data points. We tell you what the 15 data points are, you can just rerun the regression completely. That's only the cost of one additional data analysis. And so now you can just check directly that yes, definitely we can get this result by removing these 15 data points at minimal extra cost um, with, without doing extra, you know, like all of these 10 to the 46 years of, of computation. Um, and so any non-robustness we find here is conclusive from this perspective. We know that you can make this change by removing these 15 data points. It could only get worse. OK, now a few things. You might be thinking at this point, yeah, well, the problem was it wasn't statistically significant to begin with. You know, um, We're going to see an example later on of a real life data analysis that is statistically significant to begin with. Um, it's actually a very famous analysis that you're going to see, um, you're probably already familiar with. And we can make it non-significant by removing an extremely small fraction of data. So it's not just about non-significance. Um, we're going to see by looking at uh, cases where we can control this later and also some real data that it's not just about gross outliers. It's not just about heavy tails or reporting means, which are often implicated in, again, other types of robustness. Um, and, uh, you know, as, as Aaron said, I do a lot of work in Bayesian inference. Um, if you're working in Bayes, you might think, oh, maybe if I use Bayes, this wouldn't be an issue. Um, we're not going to go into it in this particular talk, but we do show in the paper that you can be a Bayesian, you can take a Bayesian approach here, and it's not a panacea. You can still have exactly these, these issues. Okay, so at this point, oh, and we're going to see that the issue is signal to noise, that this is really what, what this, this, um, this method is picking up, that this type of robustness is picking up. OK, so at this point, we talked about when do we care about dropping data subsets? Why is this um, a, a check that we would like to run? Because we care about, the again, the generalizability of our analyses. Um, we talked about how we'd like to drop data subsets if we had infinite computational power. Um, and we said that the issue is that we do not. Um, we talked about why is dropping data subsets so computationally expensive? And then we now have used our fast and automatic approximation, but we haven't actually seen what it is. And so let's just spend a little bit of time on that. Um, not, not as much as, as I would love to, um, given our, our time constraints, um, but a little time to get a sense of what it is. OK, so in order to do that, first, let's talk about a setup for dropping data. Um, so we have a, let's first talk about just a very generic data analysis. So we have a bunch of data points. So let's say dn is our nth data point. An example of this would be if I'm doing some sort of supervised learning, my data point is my set of features or covariates, xn, and my response or label, yn. But it doesn't have to be. This doesn't have to be supervised learning. So I'll collect all my data, and I'll have some parameters. Let's call them theta. So theta are the unknowns, the things that I want to learn about. So we saw in our economics example just a moment ago that we had our theta naught and theta 1. We're going to collect that together into our single theta. We have our loss that relates our parameters to our data point. And then a typical thing that we might do is we might collect all of our losses over all of the data. So let's say we have capital N data points. And then maybe we'll estimate our theta by taking the minimum of the losses. So we'll get our estimator theta hat up. OK, so a lot of things fit into this framework. Obviously, anything that takes the form of minimizing a loss. 
Um, maximum likelihood fits into this framework by using negative log likelihoods. Um, actually, our framework is much more general than this. Um, it can handle anything known as a Z estimator. And so if you have a regularizer or you're doing um, map um, in, in a Bayesian context, um, all, all of those are fine. You can do variational Bayes. Um, you can do a, a multi-step analysis where you first do some optimization and then another optimization, um, which often comes up, et cetera. Um, and so, but I'm going to keep to this data analysis because I think it's already pretty general and familiar. Um, and so let's let's stick on that. Okay, so typically in our analysis, we, we don't just find our estimate of the parameters theta hat. We now discuss um, and make our decisions based on a quantity of interest, let's call it five. And so in particular, in, when we talked about just a moment ago, uh, our, our microcredit example, we picked out a particular element of theta hat. So in particular, we picked out theta one hat and we made our decisions based on that. And so one option for our quantity of interest phi is that we particular we take out a particular element of theta hat um, and we just use its value to make our decision. So P is just some index into theta hat. Another thing that we could do is we could use not just its value, for instance, if we care about the sign, but we could use its value plus or minus two standard errors if we care about the statistical significance. So that could be another quantity of interest, especially again, if we care about statistical significance. Okay, so everything before this bullet is just in some sense, you know, really just review from your statistics or machine learning class. Now let's introduce a, a slight change to this problem. We're gonna give a weight to every one of our data points. So data point one gets a weight W1, data point two gets a weight W2, data point three gets a weight W3, and so on. And now in our original problem, we can think of all of these weights as being one. So we have this all ones vector, let's call it one sub n, n being the number of data points. Um, and that represents our weights for the original problem. And we can think of dropping a data point as taking the corresponding weight for that data index from one to zero. So if I drop the 10th data point, I'm gonna take its weight from one to zero. Or if I drop two data points, I take both of their weights from one to zero. And in general, you can see that every drop data subset is gonna correspond in a one-to-one -one manner with a different W vector, different weight vector. Okay, when I have these weights, I can go up and ask, how does this change my data analysis up at the top? In particular, what it does is I take each of my losses and I pre-multiply them by a weight. So here I put WN in front of the loss corresponding to data point N. And so if all the weights are one, I get back my original problem, my original data analysis. And if some of the weights are zero, I'm just getting rid of the loss terms corresponding to those data points. Okay, so implicitly now, theta hat, is itself a function of W. And so that makes phi a function of W. In particular, it's a function of W because theta hat is a function of W, but it's also a function of W. It could potentially be a function of W in other ways. So in particular, the standard error has dependence on W beyond purely via theta hat. And all of these we're gonna allow. Okay, so at this point, we did basically review again from your statistics or machine learning class, um, and we introduce this W concept, but it's it's sort of, you know, it's just a different way of writing things that we've thought about before. Now what we're going to do, though, is we're going to actually use W to form our approximation. And in particular, our observation is we're only interested in what happens when we drop an extremely small fraction of data. When we drop that extremely small fraction of data, that corresponds to W being very close to the all ones vector. And so phi is a function of w. w isn't changing very much. And so we could do a Taylor expansion in w to approximate phi. And that's literally exactly the approximation that we use. And in fact, it's the, about the simplest Taylor expansion you could do. It's a first order Taylor expansion. OK. So here, I'm just still showing that generic data analysis with the weights w in there. And I'm showing a quantity of interest, which we say, you know, that's how we're making our decisions. And it has this W dependence. So we have an example of our quantity of interest. And so now let's just write out this first order Taylor expansion, namely around the all ones vector, around the original analysis. And so let me, let me talk through this equation. So first, 
At the far end here, we have the exact phi of w. We wish we could compute this for every w, but as we said, that would be something like 10 to the 53 different w's. That's totally impossible that we're going to do 10 to the 53 different data analyses, so we need to approximate this. So we're going to use a linear approximation, so we'll call it phi lin. This will be our approximation. It's linear because it's just this first order Taylor expansion. So in particular, this approximation is defined to be this first order Taylor expansion. The zeroth order term is phi at the all ones vector. This is what you get by running the original data analysis. You could think of this as a sunk cost to get this because you were going to have to run the original data analysis anyway. And then we have the linear term in the Taylor expansion. This is just essentially the difference of the w's with the all ones vector dot product with, with the first derivatives. So these. So we have this difference with the all ones vector, and then we have these first derivatives. The first derivatives, you can just think of them as being the first derivatives of phi with respect to w. If you're familiar with influence functions, then you might re uh, recognize this. We're going to call this the influence score of the nth data point. If you're not, don't worry about it. It's just a first order Taylor expansion. OK, so very briefly, I'll just say that we can do a little bit more math. And by we, I mean we, the people on this paper um, can do the math. Nobody else has to do any extra math. Um, and together with that and modern automatic differentiation tools, that means this calculation is totally automated, um, that it's not something that you have to go in and write down derivatives for. Um, and you know, as, as, as I think anybody in machine learning is well aware, um, getting away from things like numerical and symbolic differentiation and having automatic differentiation tools just immediately available in so many languages nowadays has just made a huge difference and revolutionized really both machine learning and statistics in so many ways. Um, and, and this is just another great example of using those tools. Um, for anybody who happens to not be familiar with automatic differentiation, I'll just mention this great survey by Baden et al. 2018. OK, so this should be super easy to use, easy to use in that automated sense. Um, there's no need to actually calculate derivatives or do intense calculations. Two. We only have to run a single data analysis. We only have to get that phi at the all ones vector, and we don't have to actually run a data analysis at any of these other w's. We get everything via the influence scores for our approximation. And finally, I'll just note that um, you wouldn't even want to compute the linear approximation 10 to the 53 times. You don't want to do any operation 10 to the 53 times. But luckily, what we're doing is we're just looking for the biggest difference that you can get by dropping a small amount of data and so for that, luckily, we can use the linearity of this equation to just, one, compute the influence scores, which is a linear time operation in the number of data points. Two, sort the influence scores, which is n log n. But if sort is the biggest issue that you have, it's the most time consuming thing in your data analysis, I would, just, I would love to hear what your data analysis is. And then three, we just start removing the biggest influence scores to get the biggest approximate changes that are possible. And we just keep doing that either until we get the change that we're interested in um, or until we've reached that you know, alpha threshold of how, ma how many we're willing to remove. OK, so this is the approximation. It's just this first order Taylor series expansion approximation. It has the pros and cons that you can imagine of a linear Taylor series expansion approximation. But again, crucially, you can check it after the fact. You can just drop those data points from one more data analysis and see if, in fact, you get the change that was promised. OK. Also, I think a really natural question is, what about higher orders of uh, why don't I do a higher order Taylor expansion? Um, you can definitely do that for other things. We have some very, very early and unpolished work on the archive about this, um, that it might be useful for approximating things like the bootstrap. In this case, we really do depend on the line linearity to get the computational speed ups. Um, and so we are kind of relying on this being a, a linear approximation for this particular application. Okay, now we're gonna try to understand better what is happening by dropping these small fractions of data. What are, what are we really getting at in analysis? So first what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at simulated data because with simulated data, we can control the model. We can completely control what's going on. And so we know that things aren't due to misspecification or things like that. You can get a lot of intuition. And then we'll look at some real data analyses. Okay, so let's make this, if we're gonna simulate and try to get intuition, let's make this as simple a model as possible. So we're gonna use a one-dimensional linear model with Gaussian noise. So here we have our single covariate 
is Xn. And it's a real valued covariate. We have our single parameter theta that we're interested in. We have our response yn and our noise epsilon n. And so we're simulating everything. So we're going to simulate our noise according to a normal with its own variance sigma epsilon squared. We're going to simulate everything again. So we have to simulate our covariates xn. We're going to simulate them from a normal with their own variance. It's called sigma x squared. And we're simulating everything, so we have to set theta. So we'll just set theta to be negative. OK. So let's ask, let's say that our decision criteria here is, this, is based on the sine of theta hat. And we're going to ask, can we change that decision? Can we flip the sine of theta hat by dropping some of, we're going to imagine that our data set has size 10,000. We can generate as many data points as we want. Let's generate 10,000 data. OK, well, I said earlier that ultimately the issue here, what we're going to be picking up by looking at this dropping data thing is going to be a notion of signal to noise. And so in particular, signal, for our purposes here, is the strength, the signal or the strength of the effect. And so here, we're trying to change the sign of the effect. So we have to make a change, or let's call it delta, of size theta hat in order to go from theta hat to zero. OK, and so the intuition here is that if theta hat is large in magnitude, it's easier to detect its sign. If theta hat is small in magnitude, it's easier to mistake its sign. OK, noise is what makes this a hard problem. It's roughly how big of a change can you get in terms of dropping data. Um, we show that our approximate maximum influence perturbation metric breaks down as roughly a shape term times a scale term. And the shape term is pretty constant across different problems. And the scale term is an estimate of the scaled asymptotic standard deviation. But we don't have to talk about any of that right now. Let's just talk about how the noise in this particular problem is about sigma epsilon over sigma x and why that makes sense. So imagine that your sigma x is humongous and your sigma epsilon is small. In that case, your data points will be nicely spread out over the x-axis. You're going to get a super clear-cut line between x and y. And you could probably just look at it with your eyes and, and say, like, man, I know exactly what that line is, because the sigma epsilon is super small, and so there's very little noise around the line. It's the kind of thing where there's just no question what the slope of this line is. You would definitely know what it is. And so that should be a, an easy problem, a well-defined problem. Now let's think about the other direction. Suppose sigma epsilon were humongous and sigma x were super duper small. In that case, your data kind of looks like a blob. Yeah, maybe if you get enough data, in fact, definitely if you get enough data, you'll technically find something statistically significant in there, but there's very little evidence for it. It would be very hard to see what's going on because again, your data just looks like a big blob. And so it should be the case then when our signal to noise is high, this is a super easy problem, it's super clear cut. There's no question what's going on. And when our signal to noise is low, this is a super difficult problem. There's a lot of question about what's going on. It is not easy to see from the data. It's not clear at all what's going on from the data. OK, let's see what happens with dropping data. OK, so what we have here on this plot is on the horizontal axis, we're increasing sigma x. So we're making this an easier problem. On the vertical axis, we're increasing sigma epsilon. We're making this a harder problem. In every one of these blocks, we're generating our 10,000 data points, and we're asking for this sigma x and this sigma epsilon, can we drop a very small fraction of data, or what fraction of data can we drop to change the sign of the effect? So when the blocks are gray, there is no fraction of the data that we can drop in our approximate metric to change the sign of the effect. And so you see that when sigma x is very large and sigma epsilon is very small, it's a super clear cut problem. We know exactly what that line is. There's no fraction of data that you can drop to change that. When we're in this middle region, where you see that sort of lighter color, there is some fraction of data that we can drop to change the sign of the effect, but it's very large. So this is a very robust. Now, when sigma epsilon is very large and sigma x is very small, now we can drop a very tiny fraction of our data to change the sign of the effect. And that's kind of expected. You know, we just have this blob of data. It's not clear what's going on in it. It's certainly not something that like there's a very clear cut answer to what is theta, nor should there be. The signal to noise is very weak. We're not really getting a lot of information. And in fact, this picks us up. It picks up that, in fact, 
you know, there isn't clear cut information in this data. We shouldn't feel confident about what's going on in this data. And we see the same thing, not just for sign, but for sign and significance and for significance, et cetera. Okay, so the point that I wanna make on this slide is the issue that we see that this is picking up is a low signal to noise ratio. If it is not clear from the data what is going on, then this dropping data thing is gonna pick that up. Other types of robustness are concerned with things like misspecification, means and heavy tails. It's not that those aren't concerning here, but they're not decisive. Here we see a case where you do not have misspecification, but you can still be non-robust. And that makes sense. These, you know, you shouldn't probably base a major policy decision on a big blob of data where it's not clear what's going on. We see a case where you are effectively reporting means here, but it's not decisive. We could have a case where we are not robust or robust and still be reporting means. Again, unlike Hoover robustness, um, like this other, you know, sort of more adversarial type of robustness, um, the issue here is not heavy tails. We're not looking at a heavy tailed example, and we can still see cases that are both robust and non robust. And I guess I want to make a, a sort of a meta point. So, for people who are familiar with, I think in machine learning, we have a lot of um, discussion of things like adversarial robustness. Like, you know, maybe you imagine that there's a bad actor that comes in and changes your data. And I think that for some people, that can be a concern. But in the sciences, in the social sciences and engineering, it's often not the case that somebody is coming in and nefariously changing your data. It's often the case that you are your own worst enemy, you know, that you just have very noisy, messy data, that you have data that is inconclusive, that you have data that isn't set up to measure quite the thing that you care about, um, that you have p-hacking that you did. And I'll mention this again at the end, but, you know, that basically there are all these things that we can you know, sort of, you know, accidentally do wrong when we're, when we're looking at science, because we sort of, without thinking, apply the, the methodologies that are, we're told to apply. And this is meant to help us, you know, step back from that um, and see, oh, maybe there's something that's really going on and, you know, or really not going on in our data and we should be aware of that. Okay, let's, let's uh, talk through a few, a couple real data examples. Um, and then and then get to some some conclusions. Um, so there's this very famous Oregon Medicaid study. We're going to see that a small p value here is not decisive. So this is from Finkelstein et al. 2012. Again, fantastic reproducibility. There was very famously a lottery in Oregon where the winners could sign up for Medicaid. And so one question is, what is the effect? of the lottery on health outcomes. Now, this, this paper measured a lot of things, not just the effect of lottery on health outcomes, um, but they also measured a lot of different health outcomes. One health outcome was after one year, what was the number of days of no impaired activity over the past 30 days for an individual? And so there were over 21,000 data points um, with survey responders. Um, so again, this seems like something where we might be concerned about, uh, you know, maybe there's some, some missing this not at random. That's a lot of data points. And there was P less than 0.01 for a positive effect. So this is how you get written up in the news. Um, this is a big deal. You get your, your really small P value. This looks really great. But we find that that's not necessarily going to save you from this type of non-robustness, that you can have this very small P value. But in this case, we can drop 11 data points, 0.05%, and that can change the statistical significance of the result. Okay, let's also look at a case where, you know, by necessity, we look at cases that, you know, you are non-robust, um, just to show that we, we can flag things, but of course you can also be robust. And we'll also see that removing outliers is not a panacea here. Okay, so this is based on Angelou G and the Georgie 2009. This is awesomely reproducible. There are two things that this study looks at. So I noticed that there are some, some questions in the chat. Um, I'm wondering if I should try, organizers, if I should try to just finish up and then hit the questions um, just because we're, we're close on time or if you have any preferences. Okay, cool. I'm seeing some thumbs up. So questions in the chat, I will get to you, um, but it, it will be at the end if you don't mind. Um, okay, great. So, um, so this awesomely reproducible study, there's essentially two studies in here. So one is the direct effect of cash transfers for poor households on household consumption. Another one is this really interesting idea of a spillover effect. So only these poor households are getting the, the, the cash transfers, but you could ask, well, do the non-poor households in the same village benefit when the poor households get the cash transfers? 
Okay, so first let's look at the poor household study. There were over 10,000 data points. And we find that you have to drop just a ton of data points to change the result. So the reason there's a range here is that we looked at changing the sign of the result, the statistical significance of the result, both the sign and statistical significance. And in all of them, it takes at least 4%, dropping 4% of the data to, to change this result. So that's a lot of the data. Everything else we've been talking about here, it's like we're dropping less than 0.1% of the data to change the results. That seems very worrisome. Um, this is just a lot of the data. So this seems pretty robust. The spillover case is another case though. In this case, there's still a lot of data, over 4,000 data points. And yet, um, still the original analysis tried to robustify. They deleted households with consumption greater than 10,000 units. That's the largest response. So they deleted outliers in advance. And even after deleting outliers, we find that the result is still sensitive. That you can drop three data points and change the statistical significance of the result. Okay, how could this possibly be? Um, again, I think what's nice about linear regression, even though this applies way beyond linear regression, what's nice about linear regression is we can get a lot of intuition. And in linear regression, we can see that the influence score is roughly the residual times the leverage. And so when you're dropping outliers based on the residual, that's just part of what's going into the influence. If you're really far away on sort of the x-axis and you have maybe a slightly less residual, you could still have more influence than maybe something that's purely a large residual. Okay, before I conclude, again, I wanna live up to this idea of, uh, of the, the multiple points and I can't believe it's not better. And so I wanna first just talk about uh, the winding road of research that led us uh, to, to this particular piece of research. Um, so, so a lot of my work is in Bayesian inference. And so we have some work um, from way back, you know, many years ago, we started working on correcting the covariances in variational Bayes. Um, so it's sort of notorious that in variational Bayes, um, it, the variational Bayes methodology tends to underestimate variances. This actually isn't specific to mean field variational Bayes, although that can be part of it. It's, it's a general um, thing to do often with the Kale divergence, um, in particular in the direction that variational Bayes uses it. And so we have this nice sort of perturbation that can be used to correct these variances and covariances. And so we worked on that. And then we were sort of saying, oh, you know, you can't, you don't have to use this perturbation just for correcting um, the estimate of the posterior covariances and variational Bayes. You can also use that same perturbation idea to get a notion of sensitivity. So in Bayesian inference, you make two really important choices that can both be considered subjective. You choose your prior and you choose your likelihood. And so you might ask how sensitive are my results, are my decisions to those choices? And so we have some work on that sensitivity to prior and likelihood choice. And, and then it became apparent that we could use the same perturbation argument to say, well, are you sensitive to other things? Like for instance, we could put weights in front of each of the data points and say, oh, are you sensitive to those data points as a form of sort of data sensitivity? Um, and so our first thought was, you know, we could use this to approximate cross-validation. So in cross-validation, that's another case where you're changing which data points are in and which are not. So you can think, for instance, if you're doing k-fold cross-validation, um, in each fold, you're taking out one over k of your data points. Um, if you're doing, uh, you know, leave k out cross-validation, you're taking out, you know, this very small uh, uh, k of your data points. And so in all of these cases, you're dropping some small amount of data, uh, you have to rerun it a bunch if you're doing cross-validation, and so you might want to approximate that for, uh, for speed reasons. Um, but here we're sort of taking that to an extreme. We're saying, hey, you know, I could drop any of my data points, and I can ask what's the worst kind of thing that could happen. And so that's how we ended up um, at the work that I discussed today. But I just want to go off on a, a tiny bit of a tangent and say that, you know, when we were working on approximate cross-validation, which a, a number of people have also been working on um, recently, we, we tend to compare to cross-validation as being a gold standard, um, a being as being a, a just, a, and I, I'm sorry, this will be the, the last like content slide and then we'll, we'll finish up, um, as, as being a gold standard. And so we wanna ask, okay, so you know if I'm doing this cross-validation, uh, do I trust cross-validation? Because it itself is meant to be an approximation of something. And so we thought, okay, well, let's look at the, the simplest possible case, you know, to see if we can really understand it. Because I think we all know that, yeah, if I'm doing cross-validation for something like neural nets, I, I expect that there's gonna be some weird behaviors um, and some things that I maybe don't fully understand here. So we looked at tuning hyperparameters in ridge regression. There is known theory in this case, part of the reason that people love things like ridge regression is that it is interpretable and there's a lot of theory to support it. 
So there's no theory here that says that the optimum of the cross-validation loss matches the out-of-sample loss. Um, and I put an asterisk because there's a little bit more to that story, but like it, basically they match. Um, and so that sounds great if we can get the CV loss optimum. So for instance, if the CV loss were convex, we could say, hey, we're always gonna get the optimum. It's definitely not convex. I mean, it's not convex even in simple cases. Um, but it turns out that it's often something called quasi-convex, which still guarantees that there is sort of this single global optimum. But it turns out it's not always quasi-convex. We can show that it can have really non-trivial local optima. So non-trivial in that the local optima can be far from each other, and also the out-of-sample loss can be really different at the different local optima. So that's you know, really meaningfully non-trivial. And here's, here's the problem that we are just totally stuck on, but I feel like somebody should be able to solve Figuring out when this happens is just really intriguing. Okay, so I just wanna say, we have these plots. We're, we're able to show that there are a lot of things that the CV loss does not depend on. So we ended up looking at um, basically a singular value decomposition of our covariate matrix um, and uh, a, a, a normalized version of our response. We could get it down to a very, very few things that this could depend on. And now there's this crazy pattern, like there's this super, super, super clear pattern in how there's this dependency. So here um, you know, we have yellow and purple representing when we have the multiple local optimum versus when we don't, when there's a single local optimum. There is this super clear pattern. It feels like we should be able to just write an equation for this and we cannot. And maybe it's like an algebraic geometry thing. I don't know, but just it just looks so regular and so clear that it feels like there must be something. Um, and, and this is where we just got stuck. So I'm really hoping that somebody will, will look into this um, and, and clarify it because it feels like there really should be a, a nice answer here. Okay, sorry, sorry for going over everybody. I'm gonna, I'm gonna finish up here. Um, okay, so in the main part of the talk today, I talked about a way to check if there's a very small fraction of data that you can drop to change your decisions. Uh, if you wanna check that out, our preprint is up on the archive um, and there's a code and readme um, and examples up at um, my postdocs um, ZAM influence package. This is uh, for Z estimator maximum influence, but it's, it's exactly for the stuff we talked about today. Um, I'll just mention, in case you're interested in this, that, that this idea of dropping data can flag p-hacking. Um, so there's this really nice blog post by somebody who is totally not us, um, Michael Weave. I'm sorry if I'm like mispronouncing that last name, um, but there's this really ni nice blog post about how you can use this to flag p-hacking. Um, and uh, Ryan, my postdoc, wrote a follow-up blog post about why that is. Well, you know, why, or why do we see that kind of phenomenon? Um, the cross-validation paper that I mentioned with the like weird plots that like, man, they feel so... Like there's something there, but but we we couldn't quite explain it. Um, you can find it uh, on the archive or or at latest NeurIPS. Um, and uh, and I'll just briefly mention, you know, again, I, you could see this as being some kind of like, man, economics has issues, and I I just don't think that's at all the case. What I presented today, I think it's 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 quite the opposite. Economics has this amazing reproducibility that let us even ask these questions. You know, we've worked um, in this in this first paper, we looked at some some medical work in AI, and there's not even enough information to like recreate the code ourselves, much less code that we could run, um, or the ability to reproduce things, you know, easily down to multiple decimal places. And certainly that's been our experience in a lot of other areas. Um, and I think that this kind of, I think this kind of digging into the known problems with, with statistical and machine learning methods is something that I really like to see a lot of people doing. I think what happens right now is that we all kind of collectively agree that there are these issues um, and then we ignore them. Um, but maybe, you know, if we spent time on it, we could sort of say, hey, there, there are these issues. And I'm, I'm not talking just about reproducibility, this idea that, you know, we know that if you just get enough data, eventually you're gonna get a small p-value. But is that p-value then meaningfully? meaningful. You know, we have this issue that we want to do these analyses and then apply them in new cases, um, but how can we trust that? Um, you know, I think if we if we all spend time just examining the assumptions that we're making and try to develop methods to really deal with those, to really deal with the fact that we're often making inappropriate assumptions, I think we can do a lot of really cool work. Okay, thanks. Again, super sorry for, for going over there. <laughs> 
Hey, thank you, Tamara. So we're gonna have a Q and A now. Um, we're gonna we're gonna if it's okay, Tamara, if it's okay to upload the recording of. The, okay, good. So we're, we'll upload the full recording of the talk and the Q and A to YouTube later. So those of you that need to hop, um, you can watch the Q and A. And I think we're gonna if it, if Tamara, you have time, I think we'll have sort of a a more relaxed Q and A. Now I want to give you the chance to respond to some of the questions in the chat just in case those people need to leave soon um but then we'll we'll we can ask some more questions as well um do you want to ask answer the question sort of in the order that they appear is that yeah right that this? sounds fine okay. to me if sure. that works for everybody yeah so i'll just go back to um i think i think the first one we have here is a comment rather than a question um aside this feels related to false discovery rate methods similar to certain data points by influence scores some fdr methods or hypothesis tests by p-values then thresholds i mean I, I think it's a really interesting observation i think it'd be interesting to to dig in if there are more connections there I'll just use this as a chance to make um, a, a, a point also about, you know, there's some sense in which like we're using influence scores here. I feel like influence scores are this amazing idea or like influence functions and empirical influence functions are used across a lot of areas. Um, and so implicitly there must be connections to so many areas just through this. I mean, certainly we're not like doing anything close to discovering this. We're just sort of using them for this particular case. Um, and so I think it'd be just really fun to, to draw a lot of those connections. And I think it's it's very cool that people are are thinking about that here. Um, I'll go to this next one. In the simulation example, what is the way to think about the Kaveria X having a normal Gaussian noise in experiments? Does this mean that one can be more robust by sampling a larger space of X, e.g. values on the extreme ends of X? Um, so, so for our purposes, I guess one of the main things that we want to convey here is just um, this idea that this is picking up sort of what you wanted to. Like maybe there's nothing too, you know, crazy surprising going on here. Um, that if you have, and you know, maybe um, I don't know if it would be useful to draw something at this point or not. Um, but uh, but if, but if you just have, you know, like a blob of data, uh, then uh, there's nothing really clear going on in that. And yeah, you can remove a tiny bit of data from from the sides and sort of you know, make it look like anything you want to make it look like. Um, and so we controlled X mainly just to get a sense of, um, of uh, to have a way in the simulation to control that, to, to, to change when things are effectively like just a blob versus like a really clear cut um, uh, line of data. Now, um, so, so what I want, I guess what I want to suggest is that if you know that in fact, you definitely have a linear relationship in your data with theta being uh, non-zero, then yeah, I mean, I guess increasing X, the range of X is gonna help you understand what's going on with that linear relationship. Um, but I wanna suggest that, uh, you know, a lot of times here we're getting intuition from the linear case, but that's not necessarily what's actually going on in your data. Um, and so part of this is just to say, uh, mostly what we're doing here is flagging that there's an issue in your data, but there are so many reasons that that issue could exist. And I think what's really gonna have to happen in any data analysis when you flag this is now you have to go back and like look at what are those data points that are problematic, draw your own data, like like visualize it, see what's going on in there, um, and know because you don't you just don't know in advance what is that relationship presumably because you are looking into it. Okay, um, I work in computer vision primarily. Can such analyses be scaled to nonlinear models in very high dimensions where parameter estimation is tedious, like in DNNs? What are the challenges of anything? Okay, great. So I think the biggest challenge that would come up in any neural network framework with this is that we're making this, this uh, linear approximation, this Taylor series approximation. So it's fundamentally this very local approximation. And so I think this is like a, a big problem in assessing almost any type of um, robustness or what's going on in neural networks is that it's very easy in some sense to get a local sense of what's going on, like whatever, you know, sort of mode that you happen to, to have, have fallen into on whatever run of the data analysis you did. Um, and without actually rerunning your data analysis, it's hard to get a global sense. And even then you probably have like just a little bit of a global sense of what's going on. Um, so two things. So one is it is still true that any non-robustness we find is decisive. So if you were to find by running our method, which you, you certainly can run with anything that's differentiable, um, that you were to find by running our method with something that's a neural net architecture that, that you find non-robustness, um, then, then that is decisive. I mean, you, you have found it. You have found that you, by dropping these data points, you can, you can make this change. I guess what I'm suggesting is I would, I would be very surprised if it weren't the case that you could find much more non-robustness um, by getting away from that, that local optimum. And so there's some sense in which like, like to, in order for this to be a good approximation to, to probably be finding like all of the non-robustness, um, 
you probably have to have something that fundamentally, whatever whatever mode you have, uh, you're able to make a good approximation of of your global landscape by looking just at that mode. Um, and so I think that's going to be the the main problem with with neural nets um, in general, not not just specifically um, any particular type of architecture. Um, okay. Could you elaborate on your argument how the robustness you are measuring is different from adversarial robustness? I did say it was different. If so, why? I would argue you're checking for adversarial robustness because you pick the change with the highest influence. Um, so, okay, so here's 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 an issue that I have with uh, like everything in academia is we have these names and like the the English meaning of the name would make sense in a lot of different areas. Like if you say the words adversarial and robustness, like absolutely the English meaning of those words totally apply to what I said here. But unfortunately, it's a term of art, and so it really means something very specific. Um, and so that's the part that I'm, I am, uh, I am, you know, saying is different from what we're doing. Um, so here is here's a type of of adversarial robustness that people might be interested in. They might be interested in this idea. This is a very typical type of thing that people are interested in. That if I took epsilon fraction of my data, like a very small fraction of my data, and I was allowed to change it arbitrarily, like I could actually change the data points in some way. Um, and then what would happen? And so this is different in a few different ways that I'll describe from what we're doing here. So first of all, like that's not gonna happen with you. You are typically not going to just go and change your data arbitrarily. Here we're imagining that there's a bad actor, um, that that bad actor is coming in and they really wanna mess up. Like I think the, like a very, a very um, traditional example of this is, oh, you put your, turtle or whatever, or you wanted to put your guns through the TSA security um, checkpoint. And so you wanted to make it look like something totally innocuous, like a turtle or luggage or whatever. Um, and so like this is this is really coming from the perspective of like there is somebody out there who is who is willing to make these changes and they just don't want you to detect them. And so first, I think the first observation is that we're not looking at that here. We're not imagining that there has to be an adversary. Um, I guess the, the observation is that uh, we are perfectly capable of messing up our data analyses on our own. We don't need an adversary to do it. Um, and, and I really do include myself in that. I mean, I think there are just so many things that we, we all need to be aware of in, in, in doing our analyses. Okay, but two, let's get into brass tacks. We're saying, yes, we're gonna look at the worst case of dropping data, but we're only allowing dropping data. So we're only allowing, we're not saying, hey, you can take a particular data point and make it arbitrarily bad. That you can just drop the data. And this has really major effects in terms of what these things mean. Um, and so when people look at things like Hooper robustness, uh, you know, there, there are these uh, theoretical observations people can make that like the mean is inherently not Hooper robust because you could make like this, this arbitrary change and things like that. And so this is sort of uh, one of the points that I was trying to make earlier that we see that in our case, the mean sometimes is robust under our metric and sometimes it's not, that you could have it be or not. Um, and that depends on other aspects of the problem. Um, that, you know, a big issue too there is, is heavy tails when you're saying, oh, I could have these sort of, you know, again, arbitrarily large bad things happening. Here, heavy tails are not an issue for us necessarily. They're not, um, they're not decisive. You could have things that don't have heavy tails and are still non-robust. Um, and so, so the actual, I guess what I wanna say is both the, the motivation for looking at these things and the actual output of looking at these things ends up being different in these different cases. Um, so hopefully that is helpful to, to elucidate that a little bit. I think they're both useful. I, I, one thing that uh, I wanna emphasize is that I can consider these all to be complementary. You know, so, so it just depends what type of robustness you care about. These aren't even the only types of robustness. I mean, as I mentioned, you could talk about robustness to model choice. You could talk about robustness to, you know, other aspects of, of specific aspects of your data. You should just be asking every time you do a data analysis, sort of what, what things am I concerned about? What types of robustness am I concerned about? Um, okay. So next I have, um, we've, You've given us some context in previous work at the beginning. We'd love to hear more about how this project came to be. Did you go back and forth between theory and empirical results a lot? Yeah, so, so there's a little bit of, of history in terms of, um, I mean, basically we got to it because we had this hammer, this like perturbation hammer that we were looking for nails to hit. Um, so we really did start off with this, this variational Bayes um, correction work, which um, I still think is super cool. Um, and hopefully we'll actually have a new paper relating to that out kind of soon. Um, but um, but then, you know, we kept thinking more and more in terms of these like robustness directions and eventually this these dropping data directions and sort of even within that, like what could you do with dropping data? Um, and so, you know, this started off with cross-validation because 
I think that's just comes to our mind more naturally as, as machine learning folks. Um, but then, you know, I had a separately, I've had this super long running collaboration with Rachel Meager. So this was really great, man. So uh, we were at this um, conference like ages ago, maybe 2015. Um, and we just happened to sit next to each other at a table and started talking. Uh, and uh, we were like, oh man, she was applying Bayesian inference and I was really interested in Bayesian inference and working on methodology. And so we got to talking and we've been sort of collaborating ever since. Um, and, uh, and so this just seemed like a really natural confluence because Ryan had been working us, with us for a long time too after that. Um, and, uh, and, and I think, you know, Rachel in particular was really able to, uh, to see the importance of this kind of notion of dropping data in economics, because um, she's definitely the economics expert on this paper. She's providing that background. Uh, we're, we're really more like the, the methodology, statistics, and machine learning people. Um, and so it's just been super fun. And I think it was that, that combination of, oh, you know, here's, uh, here's this really cool application where this really could matter. And also, I think crucially that we could actually do these analyses. Um, we, we do a lot of work in other areas like biology and medicine, um, and it is just orders of magnitude different to reproduce in those areas. Um, we, I think a big, big reason that we were able to do this work is that we were able to run other people's analyses in economics. And I, I feel like I just can't emphasize that enough, how important that reproducibility is um, and, and for being able to, to trust these things, you know, to, to know that like we can we can trust them. I think what we're, we're talking about here in this in this talk today is like somehow you could think of it as like a, a, maybe a level two level of trust. Like first you need the reproducibility, like that if you don't have that, you can't even get to like the level that I'm talking about here. Um, and I feel like there's a lot of areas where we still need that reproducibility. So hopefully that shared that a little bit more. Um, what does the data set has excellent reproducibility mean when the data set dropping experiment seems to suggest high signal to noise ratio? Okay, so let me, let, me, let me separate out here. When I'm talking about reproducibility throughout this talk, I'm talking about the combination of, in every one of these very, very awesome published papers, the data was available to us. So I think it's just publicly available. And the code and methods were available and we could, we could apply the code and methods to the data and get exactly the results in the original paper up to multiple decimal points. So that's what I mean when I'm talking about reproducibility in this talk is that existing work that was done by these amazing authors before us so that now we could go and apply this notion of data dropping. And so this is actually, so in this paper at the bottom of the current slide that we're looking at, so we have this preprint on the archive toward a taxonomy of trust for probabilistic machine learning. This is actually, we try to separate out these different levels of trust. And so this is one separation that reproducibility is, is, is almost like a bare minimum, just getting the sense that for the particular data that you have on the particular data set that you had um, with the particular methodology that you use, that you can get exactly the results. But then of course, what we care about as we talk about in this talk is generalizability, that like I learned something very meaningful that I can apply to a new situation, a new scenario, and that that can you know, mean something there. And so in our particular paper, we make a distinction that some people do terminologically between reproducibility and then we call this another thing replicability. That like, you know, if a new lab did the analysis on some new data, they would see the same thing. And, you know, technically speaking, these are different things. You could imagine a situation where something is totally reproducible, but as we discussed today, you know, maybe um, it really depended on Jeff Bezos having to be in the lab that day. Uh, and so when you apply it in a new lab, you don't see the same results. And so what we're trying to get at here is, is there some way you could know that in advance um, or at least have like an inkling that that's gonna happen, especially when you're gonna make a, a big, um, you know, you know, policy decision or medical decision or something like that. Um, uh, there's a, an observation in the chat, uh, this person has had to drop off, but they did have some stability analysis on DNNs and they have some questions from that perspective. Oh, absolutely. I think there's a lot of really interesting work in stability and I certainly don't wanna suggest that ours is, is the only one, um, but I can only comment on, on our particular uh, notion of stability. That being said, again, I wanna emphasize the, uh, I think complementariness of a lot of these, these different methods. I think typically they're, they're measuring often like different notions of stability, different notions of robustness, um, and these can all be very, very useful. Um, Follow-up question to the adversarial robustness, shouldn't the analysis then include how likely it is to sample or construct a data set when there's no cell subset that has the influence that you're studying? Um, 
I might not fully understand the question. Um, in our case, we're sort of interested in just, is there any small subset of data that would change it? So for instance, let's think of the Jeff Bezos example. Um, you could imagine a situation where you think about like, oh, you know, I'm just gonna randomly subsample tiny subsets of my data. And if you did that, you could just completely ignore it that there was a Jeff Bezos in your data set, right? We're trying to find like, hey, what is, was there like some really, really, off data point, and then we want to pick that. And so that's necessarily got to be adversarial because otherwise you have this chance of just completely not getting it at all. Um, and so from that perspective, we want to say, okay, out of all the data sets that I could have removed, what, what was the worst case? Again, it doesn't have to be the only form um, of, of stability or robustness that we care about, but I, I think there's a, a really meaningful argument for caring about this in, in many cases. Hopefully that's, um, you agree. Um, I see how you can compute the Taylor approximation for the weights of linear regression because the argument has closed form in the linear regression case. Oh, yes, great point. So, um, so I skipped over so many details of how we how we actually do this, and I'll encourage you to check out the the paper. Um, we do not do this in in closed form, and so what we use to deal with that argument is the implicit function theorem. Um, so, so check out the implicit function theorem on Wikipedia is this really old, beautiful, venerable mathematics theorem. Um, but basically what's going to happen is we're going to end up with a bunch of totally not closed form derivatives, but they're derivatives of, of things that we know. So like the, the loss function essentially. Um, and so what we can do now is get those derivatives of the loss using automatic differentiation. So this is the idea that essentially you have coded up the loss. Um, and once you have coded up the loss in closed form, that was with a, a bunch of, um, you know, simple functions is how you must have coded it. And so automatic differentiation essentially performs uh, uh, the chain rule on those simple functions. And so it's the combination of essentially the implicit function theorem and the chain rule that gets us what we want for a generic loss. And we do not rely on a closed form solution, which I totally agree would be very specific to linear regression. I don't, I don't know that you would really be able to get beyond that at all. Great, thanks. I think I have gotten to the end of the questions, um, or at least at least done my best. Thanks for everybody who who uh, came along to this point. I, I have I have a couple of questions. Um, Please. So so uh, you know so far we've we've thought about using this as a diagnostic for published tech for published uh, studies. If I'm designing a randomized study, usually we might think prospect prospectively about power. Does this yeah. research suggest a way, you know, an experimental design that is different than just thinking about optimizing power? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that, okay. So that's interesting. I definitely think that it suggests that you should be thinking carefully of, about power beforehand. And I'm not sure that everybody does carefully think about power beforehand when, de when designing um, these randomized controlled stu studies. Um, I certainly think that it's the case that this suggests that we should be thinking very carefully about experimental design in a way that we can make sure that to the best of our ability, these issues don't arise. Um, what exactly is the form that that takes? Um, I mean, off the top of my head, I'm just thinking like, oh, you could have so many different types of, of models. Um, and so I'm, I'm like struggling to put it into words, but I, sure. I kind of feel like there should be something more concrete that can be said here. And I'm probably just failing. Yeah, just, I mean, just, I mean, power, I guess, is sort of a derivative of the, so the paper is really great. It's teasing apart, right, standard error from this robustness, even though they seem like they're related. And I guess I, I think of power as sort yeah. of a derivative of the standard error. And so I guess, you know, is there a way right. to think about, and usually we think about N and we think about compliance and these things sort of, they go into standard error. And I wonder if there's a way that we can think about how to, we can think about that signal to noise ratio instead as the thing we want to be optimizing prospectively when we design these experiments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, totally. I, I think that's I think that's just exactly right. I mean, I think I think one big takeaway from all of this, and this is like not specific to this work. I mean, I feel like there's a lot of things here that we kind of like knew already, but we're just like repointing them out. And one of them is that like if you get enough data, eventually your p-value gets as low as you want because you have the right. standard error scaling with squared of n, right? Um, and so I do think that something that is definitely the case is um, is this push to realize that, um, that like big data, if anything, from that perspective, um, I, I guess I don't want to say big data is bad inherently, but it's very easy to abuse. Um, and so, and in particular, in this particular way with p-values, um, and like it, from the perspective of p-values, the data sets that I'm talking about here, tens of thousands of data points are definitely big data. Um, like you get these squared events that are 
you know, you, you, you just want to be careful about them going in, right? Um, and so I think that that's absolutely something that, that, you know, everybody should be aware of going in is like, if you have a data set that is going to be statistically significant, almost no matter what you do, just because of squared event scaling, um, then you should definitely be careful about like, how, you know, how did you design your experiment? And is that something that's just going to happen um, because, because of that, right? Um, you know, are you going to detect things just because you have enough data to say that you detected anything? Um, and so, yes, I think from that perspective, absolutely, for sure. I'm, I'm sure there are even better ways to think about this than I am expressing right now, um, but that's at least one of them, and I think a, a, a big part of the story, yeah. There's, there's a line in the paper um, sort of towards the end that says, you know, consider a case where the signal to rise signal to noise ratio is too small to ensure this kind of robustness, then it seems necessary for the investigator to ask a different question or to investigate different data to find a, a robust analysis. And this made me think, you know, in the same sense that I, I guess we sometimes want underpowered studies to be published because if there are enough of them, we can do a meta-analysis and we can maybe learn something that is robust from them in aggregate. I wonder if there's sort of an analog here. Is there, is there a kind of meta-analysis type thing that we can do here to get an, an AMIP robust aggregated yeah. result from a bunch of non-robust studies. Although let me let me elaborate on that, like and, and the point that we were sort of just talking about with this squared this squared event scaling. So I think something that's really interesting um, that we get into way more in the paper um, is this idea that you can have um, so so specifically in the ways that we talked about, you can have sort of um, more and more and more data. And eventually you are going to get a small p-value just because of, again, the way that p-values are set up with standard errors. Um, that is not true of AMIP robustness, um, that you can asymptotically keep growing and not necessarily be AMIP robust. And so from that perspective, and I think, okay, so I am going to finally like draw this thing that I said that I was going to draw. Um, mm. So let me um, just try to break out the whiteboard. Okay. So, um, so here are sort of the two things that I, I feel like I kept describing today, but let me finally draw them. Um, and so you can imagine like two types of data sets. So here's a data set where um, that, you know, here is the X and here is the Y. Um, and we said theta, I guess I said theta was negative one before. Let's say theta is one now because I've already drawn this. Um, and, uh, and so here, this is a case where um, that sigma X is large and the sigma epsilon was small. And there's just, it's just obvious what the line is. And this is a case where you can just, we can imagine getting more and more and more data essentially from this line. And, and there's just like no fraction of data or some very large fraction of data you'd have to remove to change the conclusions of this study. I mean, it's just really obvious that there's this data. And this case that I talked about earlier with signal to noise where like things go wrong is this case where it's like, yeah, okay, so maybe data is still the same. Um, and maybe, you know, maybe even I've like zoomed in on X and Y, but like essentially this is what my data looked like. And so you can easily get situations where even if my data looks like this, that like, oh, I've got my, my significant P value and I make my big conclusions. And I guess what I want to suggest is that I could keep getting data from this and I haven't really improved my conclusions. Um, as long as I'm, I am, I continue to sample in the same way and I continue to get data in the same way. And this is a case where, yes, I could do a lot of different studies and they could all be collecting data from this exact population distribution. And it could still be the case that by getting more and more data, all I have done is artificially reduce my p-value by using the squared event scaling and not change the fundamental fact that like this is just a really crap signal to noise and I shouldn't maybe conclude too much from what's going on here. Um, and so in this case, this would be a case where you could keep getting more data and our AMIP will still say like that this is a very low signal to noise um, and that you can take a very small fraction of the data even though there's a lot of it and change it. And by the way, what AMIP happens to do in this case is if you wanted to make this um, a, like a negative slope, it'll remove like these points here, like these ones at the corners. Um, so it's like, you know, it's silly. Like it's, you know, it's just using the fact that there wasn't much here to begin with to, to change it. But I think that's what we want, right? We want something that is telling us like, hey, there's not much going on here. Somebody should really flag it and not just report a p-value and not like look into it more, right? Um, and, so, um, and, so, and so this is just to say that we have to be careful, I think, about this idea of just getting more data um, because that I think can be misleading in ways that, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure tons of people are talking about, but I think often when we talk about big data, it's as though it's a panacea. You know, that like just by getting more data, 
we're going to reveal these these important patterns in the data. But sometimes maybe there really isn't much going on there. And um, as as the line in the paper I think is getting at, um, you know maybe we really should do a different experiment rather than just get more data on a particular experiment that already has this very low signal to noise and we're really just sort of, you know, artificially changing things. I think there's, you know, um, the, oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, there's, a, there's a, there, yeah, yeah, you should, you should. Okay, cool, I was just gonna check, yeah, check out this chat. Um, I was thinking about the simulation example with the linear model and Gaussian noise. Would this research have something to say about the robustness of common metrics in simulated settings, say in Monte Carlo, or when a surrogate model is available? Or are these findings only meaningful for settings where a single fixed data set is available and no simulation is possible? Um, I definitely don't wanna suggest that this could not be used in interesting simulation settings. I certainly haven't thought about using this um, for metrics and things like Monte Carlo, um, but I mean, it seems, plausible to me on the face of it that that there could be something interesting to do there. Um, I guess I, I mostly am just going to say cool idea. Uh, let us know if you follow up on it and it goes more. I was wondering, have you have you looked into whether um, you know differential privacy is providing some amount of AMIP robustness? I mean it's a very similar notion, right? Okay, so so this I swear like this keeps coming up, and I really right, need sure. to get a better <laughs> understanding of, of differential privacy. But I looked into this a little bit just because there I feel like we get a lot of questions about differential privacy. Um, so this is I can't emphasize enough how much this has come from a place of like relative ignorance about differential privacy. So I'd love for somebody like in differential privacy to really look into this. But in differential privacy, as I understand it, um, you're trying to know if you could guess a data point's value if you knew all the other data points. So for instance, if you had like an average with no added noise, then that's like always non-private because um, you know you know every data point in that sense. Um, and so it seems to me that that could be either AMIP sensitive or not. Um, that like you, for one, you don't need randomness to care about AMIP sensitivity, which I think is kind of interesting. You know, if 0.1%, like let's say you had a farm. So I think this is a nice um, example that, that um, my postdoc Ryan um, has been thinking about. If 0.1% of your farm is on wetland and the rest is desert, and that's why you have like humongous yields compared to your neighbors, um, then like no other farmer in your desert land cares, right? They're like, well, yeah, you have your wetland. Uh, like that's not telling me anything interesting. Um, and so somehow like, it seems like differential privacy is talking about um, like a generic difference of some size is also another difference. Whereas we're sort of saying, hey, are you near a decision boundary? Like what decision are you making? Um, and then you're making your decision, you're sort of saying, oh, if I drop data, does it change that? Um, so you could be like right on the edge of statistical significance. And then it takes very little to become statistically non-significant. Like we're totally pointing out things like that. I mean, it's prosaic, but it's, it's what we're pointing out. Um, and you, so you can construct AMIP sensitive examples for any arbitrarily small difference um, instead of looking at like, oh, you know, here's a particular difference. Um, so those seem to be like two possible differences with differential privacy, but I mean, there's enough similarity that there's probably gotta be like some cool connection that somebody should come up with. <laughs> sure. Okay, I think we should wrap. Um, Tamara, thank you so much. This was an incredible first talk of this series and um, yeah, if you, I don't know if you have any <laughs> final yeah, no, words, thanks. but I think we should have it, yeah. Yeah, I just want to say thanks so much for organizing this. I think this is like a really great initiative that I'm just extremely um, excited by in general. And uh, thanks to everybody who who stayed even for the, the extra time um, and to everybody who came originally. It's really, really great to see everybody show up. So yeah, thanks a ton. Really appreciate it. Bye, everyone.